African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, and medicine. We'll explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they've been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and joining us on today's program is Dr. Harold Freeman, Director of Surgery at Harlem Hospital, and we'll be talking about the health of black Americans and particularly about Dr. Freeman's work with cancer. Uh, Harold, Dr. Freeman, we're glad to have you with us to talk about what's happening with health in the African American community, and you particularly have uh, highlighted the issue by making a comparison between the life expectancy of young people, uh, newborn in Bangladesh and in Harlem. Could you tell us a little yes. about that study and what it means? Well, Roscoe, it, it was a surprise to me what we found when uh, we, we studied uh, the, the mortality rate in, in the community of Harlem and we compared it to the mortality rate in Bangladesh. We had the statistics from Bangladesh because my co-author, uh, Dr. McCord, had lived in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And uh, we found that a black male who grows up in Harlem has less of a chance of reaching age 65 than a male growing up in Bangladesh. And Bangladesh, as most people know, is considered to be a third world country. And a poor third and world country. And a world. very, very poor third world country. The implication is that there are third world communities right here in America, which is uh, something that may be a little shocking to people, because America has the highest uh, indices of, of health, of economics and is the most advanced uh, country technically in the world. But in fact, uh, this is true. If you had done the study, let us say, in Bedford-Stuyvesant or in the Huff section of Cleveland or in the south side of Chicago, do you think you'd have found the same result? There's no doubt. In fact, we looked at, uh, at communities all throughout New York and if you put them all together, there were, it would, uh, you'd get up to about 650,000 people within various parts of New York who live under somewhat similar circumstances as Harlem. So it's not an isolated uh, finding. It, it, it occurs throughout New York City and throughout the country, and it's really not specifically associated with race. There are people of different races who live under these kinds of circumstances. But in uh, this country in particular, African Americans seem to be in a larger number well, in the, areas of poverty. There's no question that the African American experience is one of disproportionate poverty. And uh, in fact, I believe that the, the, the circumstances, uh, the health circumstances of African Americans is primarily explain, explained by the point that we represent one third of the poor, uh, one, one fourth of the unemployed, but only 12% of the population. So this disproportionate poverty is the issue. Of course, what this says, and we've been saying this in African American legends in any of the various areas we talked about, whether it's sports or business, or aviation, education, is that race is a still a significant factor in what happens to African Americans in this country. Yes, and I'd like to comment on that particular point because I, I as, a, as a health person, a doctor who has worked in Harlem for 27 years as a surgeon, I've looked at the racial issues very carefully and I've all studied, also I've studied the poverty aspects uh, as well. Now, if you look at the history of what race means with respect to black Americans, black Americans were in slavery for 250 years from the early 17th century uh, to the point where Abraham Lincoln uh, declared the Declaration of Independence in 1863. The uh, uh, Emancipation uh, Proclamation, so, which freed only the slaves in the Confederate yes, areas. I've said it wrong. <laughs> uh, the, the Emancipation Proclamation in, in 1863. But then there were a hundred more years of legalized segregation, uh, which occurred and ended in the mid to late 60s. Uh, Martin Luther King led uh, most of that. And now we are a race of people who have sustained uh, 250 years of slavery, 100 years of legalized segregation, and just about a quarter of a century of freedom under the laws of America, not to mention that the hearts of uh, people may not have been changed along with the laws. So this extraordinary history of black Americans is a major determinant of the socioeconomics of this particular group today. As you know, my father, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown Sr., started the National Negro Health Movement and led that in the Public Health Service during the Roosevelt administration. 
And as a young man, I heard these statistics and heard what you're saying over and over again, which leads me to ask myself the question, and ask you the question, why haven't things gotten better in terms of health of black Americans, given the leadership of people like my father and people like yourself? I, I believe, Roscoe, that the, the, the critical determinant of the poor health status of black Americans is related to the human circumstances in which they live. Uh, as a result, uh, a lot of the result of slavery and segregation and other factors. But here's the, here's the picture. In, in Harlem, for an example, 41 percent of people who live in Harlem are poor by the standard of poverty, which means that the family of four has, a, has an income of 14,000 or less uh, per year. Now, when you have extraordinary poverty, you also have poor housing conditions poor social support network usually, high unemployment, low education, very frequently a risk-promoting lifestyle, meaning heavy smoking, heavy drinking, drinking of alcohol, a wrong diet, high fat diet, which is something in, a, in the black communities we call soul food, which uh, may taste good, but to the extent that it has high fat and high salt, it really is not good for your health. Perhaps it could be modified. So we are looking at a a group of people who, driven by poverty primarily, are living in human circumstances that lead to, de to increased death rate and, uh, and, and lack of access to health care, high uninsurance rate, uh, high Medicaid rate, which doesn't lead to preventive services in, in, in America. So this is a complex situation. When we measure cancer death rate, for example, which is my primary interest, we're only measuring what I think is the tip of an iceberg of discontent and tragedy that is related to housing and education and, and the other factors. Okay, that I build on that a little bit. Taking cancer, for example, we know yeah. that lung cancer is probably the leading cause, and that is because people smoke. Yeah. Uh, what about some other kinds of cancers? I think African American women have high incidence of breast cancer and, and so on. Develop uh, that point. All right. Now, in, in, in cancer, the overall death rate of black Americans is, is, is higher uh, than it is for white Americans. And if you look at black males in particular, it is very much higher than, than others. The, the main reasons for the higher death rate and a high incidence uh, are our lifestyle factors and lack of access factors. Let's deal with the lifestyle factors first. Black males have the highest death rate from lung cancer in America, and lung cancer is associated with cigarette smoking. Black males over the last decades have smoked much more than other people. They die more from that disease. Why do uh, we smoke more? Um, it, it hasn't always been true. In the early 40s, whites smoked more than blacks. As education came into the picture, people who became educated began to give up smoking and people who were less educated continued smoking. So uh, the, the, the thing crossed over. The blacks mm -hmm. began to smoke more, whites less, and so the last three decades, blacks have smoked more. I think it's an education problem more than anything else. The other major uh, problems that we can mention, breast cancer, the death rate of, Amer of American black women from breast cancer is considerably higher than it is for white women. This, I believe, is primarily due to late diagnosis at the time of initial treatment. In other words, you don't think that there's a higher incidence biologically. You think the incident may be similar, but because the diagnosis is later, you have greater mortality. The, the fact of the matter is the incidence of breast cancer is somewhat lower in American black women than it is in American white women. Why is that? Uh, here again, we don't know all of the answers because we don't know the cause of, of, of uh, breast cancer, but the overriding factor epidemiologically has to do with lifestyle again. And breast cancer is a disease that occurs in affluent people why? throughout America. I keep asking uh, you yes. why, but these uh, are the things th these are good people questions. want to know. Uh, uh, we believe that the main factor is probably diet mm -hmm. and that the high fat diet uh, it seems to lead more toward to, to breast cancer along with uh, the, the, the pattern of, 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 of childbirth. For, uh, women who have very late childbirth or no children have a higher incidence of breast cancer. Uh, women who have early onset of 
menses, which is called a menarche, uh, have a higher rate of breast cancer. Western societies uh, have those factors. The pattern of, of childbirth plus the diet seem to be the, the factors that tend to explain why Western European type societies have a higher rate of breast cancer and poor societies have a lower rate. But then within that, that uh, complex analysis, we find that African American women have a higher mortality rate which you suggest might be due to lack of diagnosis. Yes, I, I've studied the matter of breast cancer very carefully, Roscoe, and, 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 and there's no question in my mind and in the studies that have been done by others that the main reason that black women have a high death rate from breast cancer is late diagnosis. Mm -hmm. In Harlem, for example, we studied 708 consecutive cases of breast cancer women who came into Harlem with breast cancer. Uh, and only one out of 20 of them had early breast cancer compared to 50% of American white women who have early breast cancer. At the end of five years, only 30% were alive compared to 70% of American white women who are alive at five years with breast cancer. Well, I know you have initiated a breast cancer screening uh, program in Harlem, and I was there the other day to yes. visit it. Yes. it absolutely fantastic the way you've organized it and the way you treat the uh, people who come for the services. So could you tell uh, our viewers something about this? Uh, first of all, why you did it, how you did it, and what kind of things happened in the center? Faced with the statistics, Roscoe, that I described, uh, just seeing extraordinarily high death rate, late, late breast cancer that I encountered when I came to Harlem in 1967, I began to think about what to do about it. And what it led to 15 years ago was a grant from the uh, Public Health Service of the State of New York to set up a free screening center in Harlem, which we did at the uh, New York State Office building. Uh, subsequently, the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center uh, came in strongly behind this and have recently rebuilt it uh, to uh, a, 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 an office that would rival any private office in, in, in the city. It's free, uh, examinations are free, mammograms are free, and the follow-up is excellent. So I, I would, this, this is called the Breast Examination Center. Well, Harvard. actually what happens there, because one of the things that I've observed about health is many people neglect to do simple things because they are uncertain, they're fearful, they don't know what to expect. Just take uh, one of our viewers on a walking visit to the center. Yes. The, the, this is a center, first of all, it's in the New York State office building, so the security is excellent. So on the fourth floor, you go in and you see a, a very beautiful center uh, with receptionists who are uh, polite and, and uh, who, who care about the patients. Appointments are readily given, quickly given. Uh, there are very skilled people there to do examinations, including the pap smear, breast examination, mammogram. Now the pap smear for the audience is a the another smear. preventative technique. Yes. In fact, let me uh, just uh, diverge a minute to say what the value of it is. Uh, cervical cancer kills about 5,000 women every year in America. A disproportionate number of them are black women. The fact of the matter is, if every woman in America had a pap smear every year from adulthood on, uh, from teenage on, she would never probably die of this disease. See, this is very interesting because in some of the health care bills and so on, they don't want to allow these procedures to occur annually. They say they're too expensive and not cost effective. To me, just as a layperson, saving a person's life and saving lives in that magnitude is certainly worth the cost. And I, I understand they've had the same question about mammography. How yeah. frequently should uh, uh, breast mammographies be done? Yes. What well, do you think about with, that? With respect to uh, pap smear, particularly in a community like Harlem, I, I would advocate that we do it every year. Uh, if you say every three years and you miss one, you get to six years. I mean, so, so we, 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 we don't want to advocate anything that would allow that kind of slippage. The point is that if you diagnose this, this disease before it becomes invasive, you can cure it and have a hundred percent cure of this problem. Right. So you can, you can completely eliminate this mm -hmm. disease. So we've set up in the breast center, returning to your other question, 
So we will do free pap smears on all women who come there along with the breast examination. Now, what about the mammography question? Uh, I've been reading that some say it shouldn't be done as with all women. It should only be done at certain ages. Well, what is the story on that? The American Cancer Society still advocates that women between 40 and 50 should have mammograms at least every other year. That's the controversial decade that's being talked about. Everyone agrees that women 50 and above should have an annual mammogram. Mm -hmm. uh, on the point of the, the earlier age group, there is debate about how much benefit it would, would, would be to have mammograms in the decade between 40 and 50. We still advocate it. The, the problem is that the breast tends to be thicker and the mammograms tend to be less accurate mm -hmm. because of that. The, the experts do not penetrate as well. But we still advocate that women should have the mammogram from 40 for the rest of their lives. You have been the president of the American Cancer Society. Yes. And in that period of time, I don't recall the years, I think it was in the late 80s. It was in 1989. You, you traveled this whole country back and forth carrying the message, and I understand you were one of the most effective presidents that they ever had. Having done that, in retrospect, what are some of the things that you think you could have done better or some of the things that should be accelerated now in terms of preventing cancer not only among African Americans but among the population in general. Well this leads me to a discussion of poverty and cancer. During my year as president what I, what I did more than anything else was to hold uh, hearings around the country to, in seven different American cities hearing the testimony of poor people of all races who had had cancer. And it was a very moving experience for me. Uh, they told us in very clear terms, these were poor people who had themselves had cancer, they do not have access to health care, especially preventive health care. Uh, they told us that they have to make sacrifices to get medical care, giving up jobs, losing, um, losing their houses, and so forth. Uh, they told us as well that uh, they meet barriers when they try to get through the, the health care system. So with this uh, information, uh, we began to, to try to have an impact on the matter of poverty connected with cancer. And this is a very lethal combination. I, I believe we, this has been heard rather well at this point, uh, the points that we made that year, uh, still percolating around the country. What it would, uh, for example, imply is that all American people should have access to health care. Currently there are 37 million people who don't have access. A disproportionate number of them are, are poor and, and a disproportionate number of them are, are black. But the question uh, has been debated this past year is uh, what do you do to give everyone access? Uh, some people say it's too expensive. Some people said it takes away individual freedom of choice of doctors. Some people say it depresses the income of medical personnel. What do you think? Well, Roscoe, I, I, of course, heard all those debates, and uh, I, I never took sides as to how it should be done. Uh, there were some elaborate plans. There were some plans that were a little more simple, uh, such as giving access to all of those who did not have access, as opposed to influencing the whole system. And I never took a strong side. My, my main concern is that no matter how we get there, every American needs to have access to health care and especially with respect to a lethal disease such as cancer. You know, Roscoe, you don't save money when you don't treat, treat people early when they have cancer. And I'll tell you why. People who have cancer will ultimately get into the hospital. If they get into the hospital late, it's going to cost more and they're going to die. If they get into the hospital early for treatment, it's going to cost less and they're going to live. We're going to pay for it. One way or another, why not pay for it and create a quality of life that's better for our people? Well, that sounds so very simple. Why is it we have such difficulty getting the society, the Congress, uh, to uh, my, identify? My, with my this? personal opinion, and this is only my personal opinion, is that we have a bureaucracy in America which has some very good points and very bad points, perhaps. Elected officials have a tendency to do things that they can perhaps do within their term, uh, two years or six years or whatever it may be, or whatever may be favorable for their re-election. The point of the matter is that it may take five or ten years to correct this system, 
and it may cost more money in the beginning to, to do it, whereas you may save money 10 years from now. But I don't think the elected officials in general have had the courage to face this in, in those terms. What about the chivalrous that the lobbyists put up that individuals would lose the freedom to choose their own positions, which I think is well, I, I not don't, a particularly I, I don't valid think point. You, you, you have to, I don't think you necessarily have to have a system that would uh, uh, would cause people to lose the ability to choose their doctor. In fact, I favor mm -hmm. the system that would allow for a choice of a physician. But again, if you have lots of uh, poor people and a limited number of physicians, eventually some will be channeled more to one than the other, and that choice will eventually be lost. Well, you know, in, in the black communities, for example, we don't have enough of any kind of doctor. So there's really so, not so, so choice. So speaking of the subject of this particular pro program, I, I don't think, see, they say there are too many specialists in, in America. There are not too many black specialists mm -hmm. of any type mm -hmm. in America. So it's a different set of circumstances. Speaking of that, uh, what kind of advice would you give to young people, African Americans, who are interested in going into the medical profession? Uh, first getting in and then after they get in and getting their training, what they do with their training? Well, first of all, I think that, that the medical profession is one that, that, uh, it, that I would recommend. I've been a physician for quite a long time. And, and I your think son the, is a physician. And I have two sons who two are sons, both that's physicians. Right. And so I, I feel very good about the profession. First of all, you have to be driven to want to help other people. And it has to be sincere. not driven to, to make money, uh, driven to help people. That's the first thing. But if you are, and if you pay your dues, starting early in school, you have to start in high school. Level, junior high school. Junior high school. You're, you're an Elementary educator. school. You're, you're an educator, <laughs> kindergarten perhaps. Uh, you're a real, I, I'm speaking to an educator. So start early. The training for doctors probably begins in elementary school because by the time they get to the college level and have to compete with others to get into medical school, which is a tough competition, you need the background. So I think if we are really interested in developing such people, we have to center our attack very on, early on in education and try to also stimulate by nurturing a group of people who really want to do something for the society. And it doesn't have to be medicine. It could be in other areas, education, politics, whatever. It's the same thing we have to do to develop people who are good in education to develop them in science. In, in your particular case, how did you become interested in medicine and what nurtured you? I had a, a family uh, that nurtured me qu uh, quite well back in Washington, D.C. Uh, my grandfather happened to have been a physician. Uh, he, he encouraged me as well. And uh, we, we were not a family that had money, but we were rich in, in uh, I think, ethics and, 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 and morals and spirit. and spirit and infrastructure of a family, a real family. And that was what made me what I am today. And what led you into dealing with cancer? Well, I, I, I'm not sure what led me to cancer, but I can say that it could have been the point in, in a way that my father died of cancer when I was 13 years old. He died of a cancer that he would not have died of today because they know the answers now, testicular cancer. And so I thought about cancer early on. When I went into the field of medicine, I decided I would go in that direction, and I think it had a lot to do with my, with my father. You, you certainly have made a tremendous number of accomplishments, um, in addition to which you've had some athletic accomplishments, which you were very modest about. You were a national tennis champion. Yes, I, I was a national uh, 15 and under t uh, tennis champion at, uh, at that point in the late 40s, and my brother and I won many national championships mm -hmm. and, and doubles. Uh, I, I think the, the, the athletic experience uh, can be separated from other things. Uh, for an example, in, in tennis, uh, at the age of eight or ten years old, I was trying to perfect my, my ground strokes, uh, and, and you had to do it over and over again until you get it right. Well, that's what life is all about. You have to do things over and over again until you get them right. I heard it was your mother who kept sending those balls over see, to see, you. My, my, my mother, she, she, she most certainly did. She, she was a wonderful mother and had a lot to do with who I became. As we come toward the core of our discussion, if someone made you the guru for health for African Americans uh, in this country, what would be the three things that you would think would be most important to improve the health status of African Americans? Well, I would start with the point 
of understanding the culture of African Americans. Uh, because the way you live has a lot to do with whether you're going to survive. So I think we need to learn a lot more about the culture of African Americans. What is the diet? How can we change it and make it right? Why do we smoke too much? Let's get rid of it. And tension, uh, because we have hypertension. Tension, tension, you're not in that tension, field, but you have hypertension. could be a factor. So I with the culture. Then I would go to the effect of poverty and lack of insurance. And we need to correct that as national uh, things that the country must do. Uh, and, and then I would make sure that every neighborhood in America had facilities that could serve the population well with the right equipment, with the right doctors. And, and uh, so those would be the things that I would deal with, the culture, access to health care. Uh, uh, education, of course, is, is extraordinarily important, and provision of, of access to technically high level and high quality of health care for all parts of our population. There are organizations, health maintenance organizations, such as Managed Healthcare Systems in Brooklyn, that deal with the community and are doing a kind of uh, outreach education, uh, preventative work. Is that the kind of model that you would support? I think that there are probably many, many models that could work, and I don't believe we should zero in on one fixed model, mm -hmm. but if that one works, we should encourage it. But there may be other ways uh, to accomplish what this. What about community health clinics? Community health clinics are extraordinarily important, but they need to be connected to tertiary clinics where people can be treated when they have complicated problems. Well, uh, one of the things that's very clear is that you've given a tremendous amount of thought to the health of African Americans and in addition have made a tremendous contribution in terms of your own work at Harlem Hospital and in the Breast Prevention Center. Uh, if you had it to go do over, is there anything you would have done different in your approach to health? I only wish that things could move much faster. I believe we're on target with respect at this point of understanding the problem that, that poverty is the driving issue that causes decreased survival of African Americans. That the health circumstances of African Americans are in the context of other negative events in their lives, poor housing, lack of education, uh, risk promoting lifestyle, and lack of access. Uh, we understand these factors. I just wish we could drive the solution more rapidly. You know, Roscoe, it's like a... Uh, I would like to continue, but we are coming toward the end of okay. our, our program. You certainly have been very helpful in helping me to understand more about health and poverty and prevention. And I want to thank Dr. Harold Freeman, Director of Surgery at Harlem Hospital, and a real leader in health for African Americans, for being with us on today's African American Legends. Thank you. Mm -hmm.